we're in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and we're looking at called into fellowship out of verse 9. I'm going to read verse 9, then I'm going to show you the word called. The key word is you're called into fellowship uh, with God's Son. It says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't miss this idea. You're called into fellowship. Watch what you're called into fellowship. Called into fellowship, number one, with his son. Number two, he's our Lord. It's his son and our Lord. Well, Christ dies on a cross, he's buried, he's raised from the dead the third day. We call it the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. All right? The moment you believe the gospel, in Romans 1, 16, it says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The power to save a person is in the gospel. That is the gospel. The moment you believe the gospel that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, that gospel is the power to save you the moment you believe. See, believe is absence of works. Believe is absence of works. Therefore, salvation is a gift. It's not something owed you. If you work, your salary is owed you. It's not a gift. So we have Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9. This whole thing is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. And so we're told that when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you enter into fellowship with God's Son, who is our Lord. Now, why is he called Lord and not called Jesus Christ? Because he holds three titles that are really important. He holds the title Christ because he's the Messiah. It's the Old Testament. He is Messiah. He is Christ. He holds the name Jesus because of his incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We will call Matthew 121. We will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. He's called Lord because after he died on a cross, was buried and spent three days and then was raised from the place of the dead. Sheol. Forty days later, ascended back to the Father and was seated at the right hand of God the Father, where he sits today in authority. And because he was raised from the dead and ascended back to the Father and is seated at the right hand of God the Father with God's authority over him, he's called Lord. He's called Lord. He's called Lord with a capital L, not a little l. He's called Kyrios. Or in the Hebrew, he was Yahweh. Yahweh. He was Yahweh. He was the Lord 
God. Think about that. Who is he here? He is God's son who is called Lord with a capital L. Not a little L. Meaning some person with authority over you like a boss or a, a teacher or somebody like that. Mm -mm. Capital L. And he is now restored to what he had in the Old Testament in Yahweh. That is Yahweh in Hebrew. Kurios is Yahweh. It's a Greek form of Yahweh, the Hebrew word. Now, I don't know if you realize when you read a verse like this, the dynamics of, of 1 Corinthians 1 9. I read it again. God is faithful. See the word is? Not in the original language. When you, you put it there, you put it there for smooth translation in another language. But the writers of the language, God, the writer of the Bible, when he leaves out a verb, it's important. There is no verb in the Greek language here. In the, in the Greek text, there is no verb. There is no is. It is God faithful. When you leave out the verb, it is one person. God and faithful is one. They're inseparably. You left out the verb. Left out the verb. God is love. God is grace. God is a lot of things, isn't he? God is light. There are a lot of things God is that is important in your life because everything God is in Christ, you become. You become the light of God. You become the word of God, right? Yes. Of course. That's because he's our Lord. He's eternal life. We have eternal life, right? 1 John 5, 11 to 13. He's eternal life. We're eternal life. He's a son. We're a son, right? He's an heir. We're an heir. Uh, his inheritance is mine now. And the list goes on, the 20 status privileges in the 50 things you receive at salvation, you're going to be losing time and eternity are yours. You don't earn them. You don't deserve them. You can't lose them at time and eternity because they're a gift. They're a gift. They're not given to you by works. They're not lost by works, either in it or out of it. Because grace has saved you. And because God has saved you, you can know this about him. You can know that he is faithful. All right? So he says God is faithful. Through whom God is faithful. Now look, there's no verb. Therefore, the word God and faithful is with whom? This faithful God, do you see that? I, I'm just trying to explain. I'm just trying to read the verse. I haven't even got my sermon yet. All right? I'm just trying to read what's written. My first rule as a teacher is to tell you what the writer told you before I tell you what I think he told you. I'm just telling you, the word God and faithful are connected. They're inseparable. They, he didn't separate them. Paul didn't separate them. He put the, left the verb out. With whom is God faithful? God, faith, the faithfulness of God, through whom this faithful God, through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, that is God the Son, the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. His Son, our Lord. How did, we, how did that happen? Right here, the gospel. Because the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, because you live under the new covenant of the church age, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. That is Galatians 3.27. We studied this. 
one of the things, one of the many things you get is fellowship. You are called into fellowship with his son and our Lord. See, at the point of salvation, Jesus Christ, although he's many things to us, he is our Lord. Everybody who believes the gospel of Christ, Jesus becomes your Lord. And God becomes your father. Your Abba father, Romans 8, 15. Your Abba father. Your daddy. Your daddy. Because you know why? Because you've been born again. And 2 Peter 1, 4 tells you you have a divine nature. Regeneration puts a divine nature in you. That divine nature cannot leave you. It's not permitted. In fact, a code word for that divine nature in 2 Peter 1, 4 is the word eternal life. When you have the human, when you have the human nature, you have human life. When you have the divine nature, you have divine life. These are gifts. You didn't earn them. They're gifts. By the work of Christ and not by your work. You don't work to get them. You don't work to keep them. They're given to you by the grace of God. They're given to you by the grace of God. And how long is that good? As long as he is faithful. And it's part of his character. He cannot deny himself. That's why we have the importance of justice in, 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 in our relationship with God. We are justified. We are sanctified. We, are, we have propitiation over us. We're no longer under the wrath of God. These are the 50 things that we talk about. Now, <laughs> that's the verse. Here's what's kind of interesting is the many times in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians that Paul uses the word called. By the time we get to verse 9, he's used it a lot. For example, look at verse 1. He says, Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And then he talks more on to that thing. And he goes on and he talks about called. When we get into later into these first nine verses, he talks about called again. Then down into verse 24 and 26, he talks about called. To those who are called both Jews and, Gen Gen and Greeks, or Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, and because of the foolishness is wiser th than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren. Consider, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to consider your calling, brethren. You know why you're brethren? Because we belong to the family of God. It's a royal family in 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. We're a royal family of God. We're arist, spiritual aristocrats in Christ. We're the brethren. God is our father. We're the brethren in the family, in the royal family of God. And so consider, consider your calling, brethren. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Because the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people and for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. That's flesh. Sin nature, another word. What is the evidence of carnality? Listen to me now. Personal sin. Personal sin in a Christian's life. It could be mental attitude types of sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. You know, where we all see what an overt is. Oh, he's drunk. Not that he did he drink. No, he's drunk. You see? So how do I get out of carnality and back to spirituality? Because the moment I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, I, I was baptized by the Holy Spirit in the union with Christ. First Corinthians, right? Galatians 5.27. At the same time, I was baptized into the body of Christ, the church. First Corinthians 12.13. We studied that. Now we're talking about something really important, and that is called into fellowship called into fellowship. Koinonia is a very special word in the Greek language. And it means a lot more than what it means in the English. Fellowship. 
means a whole lot more. So we're going to talk about that today. But how do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality? The Holy Spirit who indwells my life, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know that your bodies become the temple of God? The naos, the place where the atonement of blood allows the God to enter. And those who know God through the gospel of Christ are now into fellowship. Participants in the holiness of God. We talked about sanctification. We talked about that. How do, I, how do I get out of carnality and into spirituality? 1 John 1, 9, I confess my sin. I don't confess my sin to get saved. I confess the Lord is my Savior, that he died for my sins, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead. That's what I confess to get saved. Romans, the 10th chapter, tells you that. This is not to get saved. 1 John 1, 9 is not to get saved. It's to become spiritual. It's to get back into union with the indwelling Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead who dwells inside your body because you live in the church age. You live under the new covenant. And when you confess your sins, he says, God says, if you confess your sin, homologo, if you confess your sin, if you come into agreement with God that you've committed a sin, your conscience has convicted you. The word of God has convicted you. The Holy Spirit has convicted you. How many convictions do you need? Well, okay, I'll bring your wife or somebody else to, into your presence. <laughs> he always has another person, doesn't he? To say, hey. Watch this. Now watch this word. First down one night. If we confess our sin, maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you do, and you must do it if you want to be a spiritual person. Because you can't live the Christian life in carnality. Otherwise, unbelievers could do it. You have to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you have to live in the power of the Word of God. And these two are where all the power systems work in the Christian life. If we confess our sins, watch this now. Here's the word. He is faithful. It's our word. God is faithful. You can take the is out. Because this is the character of God, and he cannot deny himself. And the moment you got saved, you become part of him. He's your daddy. He's your spiritual daddy. Not your biological daddy. He's your spiritual daddy. In the same way, he gave you birth. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you. See, that's the work of Christ on the cross to the Christian. That goes back to verse 7. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Let me get into my study. My introductions get longer than my lessons. I don't know how that happens. I give you a moment through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9. Through your priesthood, confess sin if necessary. Why do I do it? So that the Holy Spirit can, John 14, 26 you, so that he can teach and recall the word of God from your life. Not, not just to you, but through you. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way to study by the automobile and the internet. For those who are eating lunch with us somewhere out there and listening to us, we thank you for coming. We pray today that this lesson, even though the introduction has been long, just to bring us up to speed where, we've, where we have been for the last few weeks here on Wednesday Breaking bread. It is important that we confess our sins in order to study the word of God. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. We must get out of carnality and into spirituality in order for the word of God to function properly in our life under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. We pray for these things today, for these in attendance in Jesus' name. Amen. When you look at the context of our lesson, verses 4 through 9, I'm focused on verse 9 today. But when you look at the context here, actually you could go back to verse 1 in a greater context. But when you look at it, you find something really interesting in our, in our section of passage, the context. We're taking the text out of context. All right. We're taking the text. We're pulling that out of the context. The context is verses 4 through 9. 
And what is interesting about 4 through 9, when you read it, I mean really read it and let the Holy Spirit teach you what he says, when you really read it. See, a lot of people read the Bible and never let the Bible read them. Never let the Holy Spirit speak to their hearts. It's a terrible shame what's going on in the church. But you should study the Bible you say, the same way you want to apply the Word of God to your life under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. It says the Word of God is the, it's the genius of God given to man. Listen, he, he, he says, he opens this passage up, verses 4 through 9, he says, he says that he is thankful, that Paul says, I am thankful to God for you, and he lists seven things. He lists seven things. Now, when you go back to this passage later in your life, it would well do, do, do you to read that, and it will help you understand how to read your Bible, look for things like this. He says, there are seven things that I'm thankful about you. He says, number one, I'm thankful to God's grace for you, your spiritual wealth in verse 5, that you're confirmed to the end in verse 6. Remember, we did a study on that, that you're a spiritually gifted person with ministry, that you are permanently sanctified, not just positionally and progressive, that God is faithful, and that you're called into fellowship with his son called into fellowship with his son. Now, we're looking at this last one. We've looked at some of these others. We're looking at called into fellowship with his son. In verse 9, you'll notice when I wrote this down, I crossed through the, I put in parenthesis and crossed through the word is. And I've explained why I did that. If you would, if, 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 if you would attend our Greek class, and everybody's welcome to come to our Greek class, not now because we're at the end of First John exegeting. But the next time we teach Greek, we would love to teach you. It will cost you nothing to go through this wonderful seminary of Greek language. We'll, the next thing we go through is Hebrew. But in just basic Greek, you know when a verb is absent. In the English, you understand, as in a translator, that it has to be added to make, to meet, make smooth translation. Unfortunately... The is throws, I suppose it doesn't change your thinking about it, but it changes a little bit the, the dr drama of the language that God and faithfulness are inseparable. God could no longer, God could no more be unfaithful to you than he could be God to himself. They're inseparable. And the way you do that, the way Paul was a master of the language, it's the way he did it. And after a while, you learn how Paul writes. You just learn it. But anyhow, uh, through whom God faithful, God faithful through whom, God faithful as one idea, God faithful through whom you were called, kaleo. Now, I want to show you something. I know not everybody has to be versed in the language, but I am, and I'm your teacher, <laughs> and I find it enormously important. So let me share with you this word called. It's kaleo in the Greek language, which is the word to call, like uh, my wife might say to me, Ron, you have a call. Right? A call. You were called, and it's an aorist. I'm going to explain this. I'm going to explain this somewhere uh, in point two. I'm going to explain aorist, passive, indicative, second person, plural. I'm going to explain that to you because it's going to take some explaining, but it's powerful. It's a powerful idea. Through whom you were called into fellowship. Into fellowship. That's, that's ice plus the accusative. Ice plus the accusative is a, it's a pointer. It's a direction. It's a pointer. It's a ice. We call it ice plus the accusative is a direction. A direction. This direction is going to lead to an extent. And so that's just the way it, it, it's identified. Through whom... You were called into what, we would say. What, what, where are you pointing me? Into what? Into, into fellowship, into fellowship with his son, right, and our Lord. His son, the son Jesus Christ, and our Lord. I want to talk about four things today, or as far as I can get in what time I have left. We're going to deal with 1 Corinthians 126 as far as my study. Consider... Consider your calling. And that's what I'm going to do 
in the next few minutes with, with this idea. Number one, Paul closed our content to the, to the Corinthian church, the context, the context, the context, which actually could go back to verse one, but we, we are dealing with four through nine. He closed our context to the Corinthian church by boasting on God's faithfulness and then listed, as I mentioned, the things common to all believers that maybe some didn't know about and others hadn't given it proper thought. And so he reminds them of God's faithfulness to seven things. Right? God is faithful. He reminds them. He reminds them of this in, when, when you go through these verses four, 4 through 9. And he says, God is faithful. God is faithful. He is faithful to all of these things. He's faithful to whatever grace touches your life with. Salvation, logistics, you know, your next meal. Whatever God's grace touches you. You see, that's what Paul's idea is. It deserves, we call it praise. It deserves your praise. It diver, and it does. It brings it from you, and it brings for your conversation with other people. That God touched my life in most dramatic way the other day. You know, I went to the hospital, and he did this, and he did that, and it's just miraculous what God did. Well, listen, everything God does is miraculous. It's beyond the human sphere. Everything, everything God does to your life is miraculous. You need the idea. You need to buy into that. Everything he does is miraculous. He's God. Of course, it's outside the realm of human. It's supernatural. And so he talks about it. He t Paul talks about that. He talks about these seven things. And he says, you know, you need to think about how God touches your life. How is great, and, and he goes through that list, how grace touches you how, how you, how you're spiritually wealthy and you walk around like you're the poorest man on the earth. Have you been born again? Yeah, you have the, the you are an heir with Christ and his inheritance is yours. The problem is we never, we never, we never cash in on it. We've got all of this in res reserve for us, and we never cash in on it because we're unwilling to live by faith. We want to live by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We don't walk by, by sight. We walk by faith. Faith taps in to all of that that God has provided for you. You're, it's all there for you, but you're not going to get it in the flesh, and you're not going to get it in the sight. You got to walk in the spirit. You got to walk by faith. These are the walks in your life. Like Galatians 5.16 and 2 Corinthians 5.7. Now I hope I can do what Paul did in his introduction. I hope at least the intent of my lesson is to push you in this way. When it says God's, God is faithful, he's talking about a secondary characteristic of the essence of God. When, when you put the essence of God on the board and he's omnipotent and all of that, and you put the ten characteristics, the primary characteristics of God, then you find out as soon as you've got some primary, like colors, you have a primary color, you have a secondary color, right? This is true with God. You have primary, and out of primary comes secondary. That's where grace comes from. This is where, this is where uh, fellowship comes from, this faithfulness of God. With whom the faithfulness of God is where this comes from. It comes from a who to a who. It's important that we understand that. Look, I don't have time to go into details with you about it, but you could read Romans, for example, Romans 4, chapter 16 through the end of that chapter, and he will explain to you how God's faithfulness works with your faith. How God's faithfulness is a secondary characteristic that you can tap into. Listen, you can't be veracity all the time. It would be nice if you could be. But you're not the epitome of truth. So every once in a while, we kind of shade stuff. I didn't want to tell him the truth because I'd hurt his feeling or something. You know what I mean? And that's okay. Look, that's who we are. 
That's not who God is, though. And God is immutable. He never changes. We're like the wind, <laughs> right? One moment we believe God, oh, God, I'm with you 100%. <laughs> then uh, a paycheck doesn't come in, and then we're like, well, where is God when I need him? Oh, yeah, he's there when I don't need him. And then when I need him, where is he? You see, when it says God is faithful, we're, it's based off a of primary, this is a secondary characteristic working off from the veracity of God and the immutability of God. Now, God never changes, and he's true all the time. Therefore, he can be faithful because this is who he is. This is his essence character manifested in a secondary essence. And the Bible is full of these secondary essence that work off from primaries, just like colors, just like colors in your life. The primaries produce secondaries. This is true. This is true. And the dynamics of it being produced is based on his faithfulness and your faithfulness. It produces when you see it, you see it as a secondary characteristic. You don't see it as these two things. You see it as this. I don't know. I was telling you what I see. God's faithfulness is the key. God's faithfulness is the key behind being called into fellowship with God's Son. We call that phase one salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.9. 1, That's a landmark passage, by the way. I mean... I, who doesn't? I mean, I don't know a theologian in the whole world doesn't quote this verse passage about the faithfulness of God and how it, and how it works to the a, a person's life through Jesus Christ. We're called into fellowship with with God and His Son, and and and, and He is our Lord. I mean, it's it, it's a big passage. Also, also God's faithfulness is a key to phase two, the Christian way of life. For example, listen, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Huh? No temptation has overcome you, right? Such is common to man. But what? A little louder. But God is faithful. God is faithful to what? Say, here, here's my point. Here's why I let you struggle a little bit. Here's my point. Is that an important passage to your life in the Christian life? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a gigantic passage. Could we go through stuff? Hey, we all go. There's nobody in this room that ain't going through stuff. <laughs> Come on now. Your feet are still made of clay. Your heart is made with blood. but You know what I mean? Feet of clay. That 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is well worth your read and maybe even memorization. It's a powerful idea about God's faithfulness to you after you're saved. And 1 John 1, 9, how important is that? Huh? God is faithful. How important is that? How important is that? And then, not only that, but God's faithfulness in phase three, the believer in eternity. 1 Corinthians 1.8 says that the faithfulness of God confirms you to the end. Listen to this. Confirms you to, verse 8, confirms you to the end blameless until the day of Jesus Christ. And why don't preachers read that thing and stop all this foolishness and keeping their congregations in an uproar of whether or not they're saved or not? I mean, how, how assuring is that to read a passage like that? Confirmed to the end in Christ, I'm confirmed to the end. How? Blameless, without judicial guilt, because all of that was laid on Christ on the cross. Romans 8, 1, no more condemnation. It was put on Christ on the cross. My salvation is secured, not by me, but by God to me, confirmed to the end. Our assurance of God's faithfulness comes believing the word of God. What does the word of God say about it? You should read on your own 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. 
what a one. The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and he will protect you from the evil one. Verse 5. I mean, your greatest enemy other than yourself is the devil. You're, the great, you're a much greater enemy to yourself than, than the devil is. But if you can ever win over, win over yourself to live for God, then you'll find out who the devil is as he knocks on your life like he did, Peter. Uh, he will sift you like wheat. And when he's through and God is faithful, you will strengthen your brothers. Huh? Come on, Peter. Come on. Romans 4.21. Romans 4.21, what a giant verb that verse that is. The God who has given you the promise is absolutely faithful to bring it to completion. He who has promised will perform it. Not you, God. He didn't give you the word of God and the promise for you to do it. He gave it to you so that you would let him bring it to. Listen, you have to walk it by faith so that he can do it. That's the faith cycle. You need to learn the faith cycle. Nobody teaches anymore. Nobody, everybody preaches, nobody teaches. That, that's my pet peeve. That's, that's my little sermon for the sidebar. That's a sidebar. You ought to read. Hebrews 11 is not a definition of faith. It's the mechanics. You know how I know that? I read the rest of the chapter. <laughs> he lists a whole bunch of people. It's the mechanics of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And then he goes through and he shows you case after case after case, right? For the next 40, for the next 39 verses, all he does is show you one example after another after another. What was he doing? He's showing you the example of it, of the faith cycle. With respect to the promise of God, here's Romans 4, 20 and 21. He says, with respect to the promise of God, you know what the promise of God is? We call it categorical Bible doctrine. Whatever the promise is, is always categorically taught. What does God promise me about yada yada? Well, the yada yada is the category. <laughs> What's he promised me about marriage, divorce, yada yada yada? You understand what I mean? By the way, that's Hebrew, yada yada. Not just Seinfeld. Uh, for example, when he's talking about Abraham in Romans 4, 21, 20 and 21, he's talking about Abraham. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the Abrahamic covenant. He's talking about what he says, the promise of God given to Abraham. He's talking about the categorical doctrine of the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12, 15, 17. You got to learn that God speaks to you in volumes through categorical thinking. What's the Bible say about yada yada? With respect to the promise of God given to Abraham regarding the seed, you remember, where Abraham's 100 and Sarah's 90, you know the deal. With respect to the promise of God, talking about the Abrahamic covenant and the seed section, he did not waver in unbelief. You know what unbelief is? A-P-I-S-T-I-A, -I -I that word right there, that's the alpha primitive, that's unbelief. Do you know what P-I-S-T-I-S -I -I is? Just like that is like that. You know what that is? Faith. This is no faith. This is faith. Now, if you're without faith, there's two, two, two basic reasons. Either you're not listening to the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. Or you're not applying it to your life. The word of God is not being applied to your life. You're, you're not taking it from hearing to believing, from believing to uh, applying, and from applying to completing. You're not doing that. That's the faith cycle. You're not doing it. I mean, how's, how difficult is this to do that? It's nothing but, listen, people don't know that. They think that faith is some kind of mystery. That if I, just, if I just pray enough, if I just hang on long enough for something, listen, if you hang on long enough, he'll bring you to a study like mine will tell you the faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And then you've got to believe it. And once you believe it, it becomes your faith. 
And when it becomes your faith, you have to walk it. You've got to walk it. And when you start walking it, then God is obligated himself to complete it, to do it. That, well, see, that's this, this is his passage. With respect, with respect, with respect, with respect to the promise of God, he didn't waver in unbelief, no, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured, fully assured, that's confidence in God, God's character, that God, listen, fully assured that what God promised, God was also able to perform. Oh, he, he couldn't do that. I'm 100. My wife's 90. She's been in menopause so long I can't even remember it. I'm too old. I can't remember anyhow. Well, it's like riding a bicycle. I don't even know what a bicycle is anymore. Well, you never can. It's just like riding a bicycle. <laughs> No, no, you missed that. Be, being fully assured that what God promised, God, 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 he had promised it, and he'll deliver. And it don't matter how it looks, because you're not walking by sight. I don't care how it looks. I don't care how many people tell you how it looks. If the Bible says it's that, it's that. Because God is faithful to his word. To his promise. Agreed? Whew. Point number two. Don't let me get past my time here. 1230, I got to go home. And you got to go back to work or do something. Uh, ten, ten minutes? Okay. Every believer, every believer is called into fellowship with God's son at the moment of believing that Jesus died for his sins, died for his sins and the sins of the human race, was buried and raised from the dead third day. That's 1 Corinthians. Look, you just need to read this. That, right? I put it on the board for you. you. You need to be sure you got that, that diagram on your piece of paper. Now, I told you that this word in 1 Corinthians 1 9 is kaleo, is an aorist passive indicative. It's an aorist passive indicative. Now, I put on your paper, there's nothing like the aorist tense. The aorist tense is unique to the Greek language. But here's what it means. It means that aorist tense is a point in time connected with a point in past time. It's a point in present time connected with a point in past time, which at that moment, when you believed the gospel, you were called into fellowship with his son. Now think about that. See, here, here, here's that past point in the bigger picture. Christ dies on a cross. He's buried and he was raised from the dead third day. Two thousand years ago. I come along in 19, I don't know, 63, somewhere like that. It's like riding a bicycle. Somewhere, this is 2000, along 1963. I believe that. I believe that work, and listen, it wasn't easy for me to do that. It was not easy for me to believe that some old boy, a Jewish guy, lived 2,000 years ago, died a political enemy of Israel at their hands, and all I could think of as a college student, that's Aristotle, that's Plato. I see what he got. Now, how did that guy who died, buried, and declared to be raised from the dead, how could that guy possibly affect my life in 1963? And there's no way you can rationalize it. There's no way you can put it in test tube and figure it out. You're either saved by faith through grace or you're not. And it became that clear to me. You either believe it or you don't believe it. If you're going to sit and try to put it in test tube and figure it out, it ain't going to work. If you're going to try to, to figure out some kind of logic to it, there's no logic to that. Man dies. I mean, see, I struggled with that stuff. I figured he was just, you know, he was just one of the, the thinkers of the day that the rulers got after and snuffed them out.
And how is this guy who died 2,000 years ago going to affect my life? And boy, has he ever. <laughs> has he ever. And I wasn't an easy believer. I'm going to tell you that. Anybody who knew me knew that. This is the era's tense. At point in time, divorce from time. But actually, it's a point in time connected with a point in past time, which at the moment we believed, we became well, uh, this thing right here. The moment I believed that, I got this. <laughs> I, got f I got 50 things that I can never lose in time and eternity because of grace, not by works. And those 50 things, as I began to study them and learn them, absolutely revolutionized my life. I later found out that's called transformation. I didn't get reformed. I got transformed. There's no way to compare these two. I didn't get it. The passive voice is interesting because we call that the voice of grace. It means a subject receives the benefits of fellowship. He didn't earn them. didn't deserve it. But by God's grace, for by grace you're saved through faith. But in grace, I receive the benefits of being called by the baptism of the Holy Spirit into Christ, into fellowship. Into fellowship. The indicative mood is in the Greek language is mood of reality. The reality of being called into fellowship with the Son, whether you know it or not. Did the Bible say you were? But did the Bible say you were or not? He said, right, all the Corinthians were. God says it. I understand it. Good enough for me. You know? I stand on the promises, not the premises. And it's just not difficult for me. Even though it was difficult in my earlier days. Today it's not difficult because I've grown to have a great relationship with God. That's the joy of my life. It is the joy of my life. The, the fellowship I have with him and others of like minds is the joy of my life. It is the absolute joy of my life. Romans 10, Romans 10 13, uh, as you well know, it says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How about that? You see, here's the word called. Kaleo. It means an invite or a summons. To appear. Or to receive. In other words, I got a call. Somebody call me. Or you have a call, I called somebody. It's an invite or a summons. So God sent his son, invited everybody to come to his son to be saved. Agreed? Yeah. <laughs> That's the only way you're going to get saved. Ain't no other route. If you want to get saved, then you have to respond to the invite by RSVP, which is you calling back and saying, I'm in. He calls you by his gospel into fellowship. When you respond, when you call him back and say, I'm in, RSVP, you're in. Matthew, you want to, you want to, Jesus gave a great parable, Matthew 22. It'd be well worth your read because you see the word called used re really neat in it. Listen to 2 Timothy 1.9 who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Holy calling. Not according to our works but according to his own purpose or plan and grace which has granted us, what granted us in Christ Jesus, watch this, from all eternity. You know, where that, you know where that point goes back to all eternity? To the eternal life conference when this all was laid out. And it caused a rebellion by Satan and the angels rebelled because he said the centerpiece of my program of the human race that's coming is going to be my son, Christ. It caused a rebellion. Did you know that? You do if you go here. 
Point number three, how much time I got? About a minute? Three minutes. <laughs> well, let me introduce this. The word koinonia, fellowship, in the Greek language is koinonia. The interesting thing about koinonia, it refers to sharing or participating. Sharing or participating. And it depends on what the side is. For example, here's our meal. Some of you brought food and shared it. Are you with me? And the rest of us came and participated in your sharing. That's the word koinonia. That's the word koinonia. Isn't that interesting? And what a wonderful place to be able to explain it in such a way that it makes sense to you at this wonderful luncheon. Koinonia. For example, the word participation is interesting. Always remember the distinction between the two, yet they're connected. Agreed? Listen to me. Right? Look, two, two ideas, right? Sharing and participating. Remember that there's two sides of this. In Philippians 1, 5, and 6, I, this is under point three, in view of your participation as koinonia, It's the word fellowship. But the emphasis is on the participating side rather than the sharing side. Are you with me? Like, like, like for a lot of us today that came in, and the, here's the stuff, and we thank you. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your vittles with us. Thank you so much because Amen. that's enormous grace. And, and those of us that know the two sides of this just are so thankful for that. In view of your participation in the gospel, watch this now, from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing. Look, there's, they got saved one day and they're still saved. <laughs> you know why? Because they got saved by grace, not by works. Confidence is the very thing that he who, that's God, he who, became, who began a good work in you will complete it, perfect it, is telia, teleos, means complete it, will keep it in completion, will keep it perfect in completion or f a finished product, all of that's teleos, until the day of Christ. You know what that is? For us, it's a rapture. Talking collectively, individually, it'd be a day of death to be absent of the body, be the present with the Lord. But in the bigger picture of it, collectively, those that have gone before will come with him and we will be caught up with him. This is what we're talking about. Koinonia. The koinonia of the gospel from the first day to now God is creating a good work with you and will hold that finished product of the work of Christ on the cross. When he died on the cross, when he said it is finished, he used that word in the verb form. Put it in the perfect tense. The teleos. Well, there you have it, guys. So I got I to gotta, I gotta wrap it up today. You got point four to do. You need to really read it. Irrevocable. God's call to salvation is irrevocable. Irrevocable. I didn't say it, didn't write it. I just repeated it. Be sure to read that. That, that will give your final point of assurance. Well, thanks for coming. And thank you for sharing. For we could participate. And when you have both of them, we have what? When you have both of those come together, you have what? Fellowship. You have koinonia. How wonderful it was to participate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of these words from the word of God. Bring them with clarity through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to our lives as revelation of truth. And may it change our life. Jesus said you will know the truth and it will set you free. We look for that out of John 8, 32 in our life, even this very day. In Jesus' name, amen.